Welcome to 90s Gate, where we take a deep dive into queer art and culture from the golden era of the 90s. On this episode, it's all things Madonna, as we continue our chat with the visionary director and choreographer, Mr. Vincent Patterson. Vincent takes us behind the scenes of the years he spent creating for Madonna. These collaborations include the incredible Blonde Ambition Tour, which was captured in her documentary, Truth or Dare, along with many of her most iconic TV performances, her Marie Antoinette inspired performance of Vogue on the BMAs and her Academy Awards performance of Sooner or Later from the film Dick Tracy. We start this episode with their first project together, Madonna's controversial Pepsi commercial, the one that would eventually be pulled from TV screens after the Vatican threatened a boycott. You mentioned Madonna before, and obviously that's a massive part of your career and your legacy. Tell me about meeting Madonna for the first time. You would have had, I guess, some preconceived notions about the kind of person she was or the the um the 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 intimidating i imagine intimidating nature that she would have tell me about meeting madonna for the first time well with madonna i was a little bit of a fan even though what i what, what was confused me about madonna was she always talked about in the interviews that she was a dancer she was a dancer she was a dancer and then you look at her music videos and she was just like flopping around. She wasn't really dancing at all. And I thought, why is she telling everybody she's a dancer if she doesn't dance? So um, a director, Joe Pitka, called me and I had worked with him many times and he had called me down. He said, listen, I'm doing a a project with Madonna and she doesn't want to dance. He goes, I don't know what the fuck I'm supposed to do with her. She doesn't want to dance. You know, could you come down here and just, just, just come down, would you? And I said, okay. So I came down, I'm standing with Joe and Madonna and her entourage go walking by us. And I'm kind of a little starstruck. And Joe goes, oh, Madonna, wait, I want to introduce you to Vincent Patterson. He's, he, he came to work with us as a choreographer. He's Michael Jackson's choreographer. Madonna looked at me and said, I don't need a fucking choreographer and walked off. You know? <laughs> and that was the end. And I was like, oh, my God, man. Talk about face on the floor, you know. I think I got down on my hands and knees to grab it and put it back on. But <laughs> anyway, I was going to split. And Joe said, please don't go, don't go, just please stay, please stay. I said, okay. So the good thing that happened was pretty soon after that, they were trying to get a shot where she was on a platform and there was a camera that was coming up and she was supposed to do a a turn and turn and face the camera just as it got to that height. Well, they were having a really hard time coordinating it. And I said to Joe, I can make this happen in two minutes. And she can be the fuck out of here. And he said, please do it, do it, do it. So I talked to the the crane operator and I gave him some numbers and I went over to Madonna and I said, I'm not choreographing anything, I promise. I'm just fixing the numbers so that, you know, you can get out of here. And she said, well, then fucking do it. So I said, okay. So I counted them both and she did her turn and the crane operator got there and they got the shot and she left. Joe said, come back tomorrow, please. So I came back the next day she, he had a bunch of extras on the set, dancers, and um, he said, just do something with them. Give them something as they're running down the street or something. Give them some movement. So I started to give them some little steps, and they're all standing in front of me, and I, we're just on the big sound stage. and I see the dancers start stop paying attention to me and start to look kind of over my shoulder, and I turn around, and there's Madonna, and she's got on like a robe and like bunny slippers kind of, and her hair and curlers. And she goes, what are you doing? I said, it's not for you. It's not for you. Don't worry. I I was so paranoid. It's not for you. I'm just, this is something Joe wanted for the background. And she goes, no, I like it. Let me get changed. I want to come back and learn it. So she came back and learned it. And I did a couple little other moments in there for her. And um, yeah, and that was the first, that was the first project with her, the Pepsi commercial that got pulled. Yeah, because it was... uh, this is what I was about to say. Yeah, like on, the, on that controversy. Well, what happened was she had used the music to like a prayer and all these Christian groups, because in the video she had used a black saint, all these Christian groups put up all this stink and Pepsi wind up, wound up pulling the commercial, you know? God, yes. but it had already been seen, but like a billion people. So that was cool. You know, they'd already seen it. Amazing. Yeah. And started your, <laughs> yeah. Your professional um, connection with Madonna it, uh, was the next step. Express yourself. Yes, it was actually. Um, she she had her her manager Freddie Demand at the time had called and said Madonna wants to work with you on 
video that David Fincher is directing, Express Yourself. And, you know, would you do that? And I said, I'd love to. So uh, we worked together and I put something together. But the funny part was when we, excuse me, I, I choreographed a lot of little moments in that. And this is something, again, that because choreographers are in, in this, my business, my end of it are pushed under the rug, people don't really know what we do. But in that project, I mean, I did all the stuff with the guys doing push-up formations. I'd set, I taught her how to sit elegantly on a couch and smoke a cigarette with a, a long cigarette holder. I showed her how to crawl across the floor like a cat and pour the water, the milk down her face. You know, all those things that choreographers do, but they don't, people don't realize that. They think you just do the five, six, seven, eight, here's your arms and legs. So I had choreographed this little section for her where she's kind of behind a screen, a dressing screen, and she had some movement to do. And we'd rehearsed it in a studio and she looked great. She looked fabulous. She seemed happy with it. We got to the set and she started doing her own stuff. She didn't do my work. She started doing her own movements. And I, we, he, David Fincher stopped after the cut and, and I went up to her and I said, Madonna, what are you doing? Well, you know, I was thinking that maybe I would do some of this instead, some improv. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to tell you something. I'm a very honest person. And what I created for you is a lot better than what you're doing right now. So, but you know what? It's your career. And if you don't want it, that's absolutely fine with me. You, know, you, you hired me and you can do what you want. And she did my stuff instead. So that was kind of step number two with Madonna and Vincent. Building up that, that rapport. And also what happened was I did a big piece for her at the top of this staircase. And um, she's in a black suit. And um, at the very end of it, you know, she points and she goes, I, don't, I forgot what I'm supposed to do with my hand. I'm supposed, I forgot what I'm supposed to do with the other hand. And I'm down there with all these guys, you know. I said, why don't you just grab your balls? You got bigger balls than anybody on this entire set. And she goes, okay, bam. And she grabbed her balls. So that was like the second box grab, you know, first I gave it to Michael and then I gave it to Madonna. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Another oh crazy iconic video is Vogue. I guess this is the next step with working with Madonna. How, um, first of all, just iconic when you think of music videos, so implanted in everyone's minds. How um, aware were you of the gay ballroom scene and of voguing prior to Madonna bringing it to the mainstream? Not at all. In fact, what happened is um, Madonna had hired somebody else to choreograph uh, the Blonde Ambition Tour. And she had worked with this choreographer who was there with the dancers as well for a month and the, and the two backup singers, Donna and Nikki, for a month. And hadn't finished one piece. And I got a call at home, like I did from Michael Jackson with Madonna being frantic. Oh my God, it's falling apart. I have all these tour dates set. I don't know what I'm gonna do. You know me, you can handle me. You, you know what to do with me. You know how to handle the dancers. Please, can you come and do this show? Please, I need you, I need you. So after some long negotiations where she was a pain in the ass, um, uh, I, I said, oh, I, oh God, you know, she was bitching over some small monies because they had paid the choreo other choreographer a lot of money. Sure. And then they had to fire that person, you know. So she wanted to keep in the same budget and bring me in to do the entire show and co-direct it because that was one of my criteria. I said, I'll choreograph it, but I definitely want to direct it. And she said, well, co-direct it with me. And I said, okay, I'll co-direct it with you. That's fine. Because some things were already in the works that she had already decided on some set pieces and stuff like that, you know. But the first day that I went down to work with her and the dancers and the singers, um, they showed me what they had, which was half of a piece. And that was it, half of one song and that was all. But so I finished that song that afternoon. I choreographed Express Yourself for the stage. I did the whole thing. And then before we left, she said to me, um, listen, I, I know this isn't part of, what, of, of the tour yet, but..." I'm going to do this video tomorrow, Vogue. And, um, you know, I, I want you to take a look at what we're doing. And I said, okay. So she showed me what had been created. And um, 
two of the dancers, Louis and Jose, who really were from that gay Vogue world in New York, had created all the Vogue movement. But it wasn't necessarily a dance. It was movement that was kind of not clean. It wasn't perfect. And so I spent a couple hours with them taking the movement that they had and cleaning it, putting it in a dance form so that it would have something that they could do and could be repeated. And um, But I don't take credit for choreographing Vogue, uh, that Vogue. Um, that was really not mine. That was Jose's and, and Lewis's. They, they really created that work. And even though I came in and helped out, uh, I would never take credit for that. that. That came from them. And it was very, very special. And, uh, and I'm so proud of what they did. And I'm proud of what they all did. It was a phenomenal video. Phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think, were they the guys, do you think, who maybe would be responsible for introducing Madonna to that world, that voguing world? Because I guess um, the urban legend is that she went to an event in New York and like a, a gay ball, um, life ball maybe or something, and she saw voguers and wanted to bring that to the mainstream, wanted to incorporate that. I guess the guys are the ones who maybe... I, I don't think that's what really happened. I think what happened is after she... <clears throat> When I wasn't there for the audition for the dancers because I wasn't part of the tour then, then, but I know that when she auditioned them, she had them, they did a dance combination and they also did freestyle. When Lewis and Jose did freestyle, and this is what I'm told anyway by the dancers and who were on the tour, that when they did voguing, Madonna was like, what is that? And uh, she had auditioned people in LA and New York and then she pulled out Jose and Lewis and really loved what they were doing. And I'm pretty sure they were the ones who took her and introduced her to the world of Vogue, the gay world of Vogue. I don't think she really had any idea before that, that it even Incredible. existed. Incredible. And then obviously yeah. the Vogue that, um, the live performance of Vogue that everybody remembers so well, the Marie Antoinette VMA's yeah. performance, just spectacular and such a departure from I guess what everyone's image of Vogue up until that point had been visually. Um, tell me a little bit about creating that. And then also another urban legend that I'd heard was that that wasn't the only time that that was performed, that it was performed another time, maybe the day before or the day after as well. Is that true? The day after, yeah. Right. Um, well, Madonna called me again. Uh, once the tours happen, you know, the choreographer director doesn't go with them. They, they go out on their own. So um, I had, um, I mean, I, I started in Houston, I went to New York. Um, they were gonna, they just started shooting the documentary, which wasn't part of anything at the beginning, but then they started shooting it. And so I had to go to Stockholm to kind of see, put the show back, tighten it up a little bit, you know, because then we went to Paris and they shot some stuff in Paris. Uh, so when, and, and I created a version of Vogue for the tour. I mean, I used a lot of the movement that was already created, but you know, I had to style it and I had to stage it in a whole different way uh, for the whole piece because in the video, there's only about you know less than a minute of real voguing, you know. So I had to make the whole thing happen and to, to take four minutes or four and a half minutes up. So I had done, you know, I'd worked on it a little bit at the beginning. I worked on it for the Blonde Ambition tour. She called me up and she said, hey, listen, you know, I'm going to do Vogue for the MTV Awards live and I and, and I want you to do it. And I was thinking that Donna and, and Nikki and I would wear suits like I do at the opening of the show. And the guys, though, would put it, be in skirts. And I said, why? You know, you're always doing something that's so different. You know, you're always breaking people's face with something new coming up. Let's do something new. And she said, well, what? She's, she wasn't like Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was like, well, what do you think we should do, Vince? And I would think about it and I would tell him and he goes, great, let's do it. With Madonna, you know, it's like, well, what's your fucking idea? You know, and I said, I don't know, Madonna. I have to go into a studio and I have to play. I have no idea what to do. So I almost choreographed and directed a tour for Diana Ross that didn't happen, but I had these big fans and for, it was the disco era kind of, it was her disco music. And I was going to do these fans and do all this fan stuff for the disco section of the Diana Ross show. And I just thought, I don't know why, instinct, whatever you want to call it. I grabbed the fans, a couple fans, and I took them down to the dance studio, just me alone. 
And I started playing with them in, in terms of Vogue and all of that. And I thought, shit, you know, this, this really could be like the French court of the, 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 the 18th century. And, and the guys who are pretty much all gay anyway could be very foppish and, you know, and it, it would all work, be effeminate, and it works, you know. Madonna, who thrives on presenting a new visual every time we see Same her, yeah. could be something she'd never done before. And so I called her back and I said, I have a fucking great idea. What? Marie Antoinette, you're going to be Marie Antoinette and the girls are going to be in your court and your ladies in waiting and the guys are going to be in the, the guys in the court. And she goes, that sounds like a fucked up idea. And I said, well, why don't you get your butt down here to the studio and see what I'm doing. And if you like it, we'll do it. If you don't like it, you can hire somebody else, you know? So she came down, just she and me and, uh, and I showed her what, what I was doing and she loved it, of course. And, um, and so we rehearsed it, we rehearsed it. And the only part they were really nervous about was the three girls when they had to flip the fans and catch them because it was live TV. So um, we worked on that intensely, intensely rehearsals. I mean, they would do it like 30 times, just like, you know, to be sure that they could flip it and flip it and flip it. And I remember, after Madonna got off stage, she goes, all I could think of up to those fans was those fans. But once I caught that fan, I was like, yay, we're moving forward, you know? So anyway, it went great. It went great. And it was spectacular. Um, I was directing a, a benefit for APLA, AIDS Project Los Angeles, um, at a little theater here. Um, it was to you know, get money, benefit for, for AIDS and... Um, so I was asked if I would direct and stage the show for them, not really do any choreography, but just kind of direct it and stage it. And it was the next night. So after we performed, no, well, after we rehearsed in the afternoon before she did it live, I, I told her what I was doing. And, you know, she was such an advocate, um, you know, for AIDS education and AIDS information and getting all that out there when I told her what I was doing and I said, you know, why don't we do this tomorrow night? I said, but what I'd like to do is not tell anybody about it. I want to make it a complete secret. So I don't want anybody to know except the technical people, my producers, the people that I'm working with. And she was like, great, let's do it. So we got everything down there the next day, got the costumes, got the little door that she walks through and the curtains went up the next night and the music started and people didn't know what to do because half of the audience or maybe a little bit more had seen her the night before and they couldn't believe that they were seeing it live in front of their faces. Yeah. For the ones who hadn't seen it, they had heard about it and now they were going to see it. And it was, uh, it was absolutely amazing. It was amazing. And she was already a heroine in the gay world for everything that she had done. And uh, it just boosted her even higher. So, and I was just so happy that she did it and, and everybody had a great time. It was a, it was such a positive, a positive situation. Yeah. I would kill to see footage of that second performance. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the roof would have been the place when people realized, holy fuck, that's Madonna doing. Really? This. Yeah. Really? Oh my God. I can't even imagine. I'm getting oh. goosebumps just thinking about it. That's, <laughs> that's surprising <laughs> as well. The, the best. Um, we talked before about the Super Bowl and reinventing, um, or not even reinventing, inventing the aesthetic of the Super Bowl halftime show. Another thing that um, I give total credit to you and Madonna for is reinventing the touring aesthetic and the live show aesthetic. Oh. When you think of the Blonde Ambition tour, no one had ever seen anything like that before in terms of mixing a rock concert with theatrical. It was like Broadway meets a pop concert and really has become the blueprint of touring still to this day. Everybody incorporates the costume changes and the set pieces and the themes. And I mean, right down to, I remember her coming out with the microphone and everyone being like, this is just a whole new, so that she could dance. Yeah. It's amazing to think, yeah. that and think that was the first time we saw those things. That was the first time we saw a show with, because even Michael with the bad tour was he had the dances and everything, but it wasn't as, there was no, um, Oh, no. Storyline. Story no, no, no. Or... No. 
we, we used, we didn't use special effects. We had no projections. It was only about, we had projections on one piece, but that was it. Um, it was predominantly with Michael, just about the lighting. And I mean, I did one thing, which was put him on a cherry picker and had him go over the heads of the audience. And in, in a kind of, um, a moment that was uh, for a thriller, that was a, um, like a magic trick. He disappeared and appeared on the stage and, you know, but other than that, it was only about Michael just performing first by himself alone for the first time in history, you know, and, um, so that's all we were concerned with, with Michael, but Madonna, you know, I mean, she was so open to my thoughts and my ideas and I come from theater. I mean, I was an actor first and a stage director and that's what I did, um, uh, before I began to dance. And so she was so excited when I brought these ideas to her and through the rehearsal period too, you know, things got crazier and crazier and crazier. I mean, well, she gave me her, what, what she had originally created for the song list. And for one thing, she had put Vogue in the middle of the show. And I said, Madonna, you have Vogue in the middle of the show. And she said, well, what do you, where do you think it should be? I said, it's gotta be the last song of the show. It has to be. I mean, you can't not end this show, this Blonde Ambition tour, without Vogue, it's, it's going to be a monster. It had just started to come out. And so, you know, she, so she said, all right, let's do it. So she was so open to that. Um, the thing with the, uh, on the bed and like a virgin, for instance, that was totally out of this warped mind. But, you know, she had said to me, I said, well, what about like a virgin? What are you thinking? And she said, well, I was thinking I would do something kind of just heavy rock and roll. I'll play the guitar like Patti Smythe or something like that, you know? Well, I had a friend who passed away. Her, no, her name was Ofer Haza. She was a Yemenite singer. And she was one of the first people to ever come out with kind of world music. She had created an album and that had a dance feel, uh, Yemenite songs, language, uh, but sung and, and it had a dance feel to it. And I, so I said to Madonna, Madonna, I have an idea about, you know, uh, this piece. And she said, well, what? And I said, did you ever hear of Ofra? No, I never did. I'm going to give you this, take this music home and listen to it. It's very middle Eastern, but I just want you to listen to it. So she came back and I said, so my idea is that you're on this big bed and the two guys, Vogler guys are going to be like, um, head pieces at the top of the bed. And I'm going to put tree limbs in their arms so that everything that moves we'll have this tree limb of feel. And, and she was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And so that's what I worked on for a day. Well, or half a day. The next day she came in and with a bag and she said, look what I got, look what I got. And she opened it up and it was a cone bra from Gautier, <laughs> those cone bras. And she said, I said, what are these? And she said, Gautier made them for me, but I never used them for anything. I said, fuck the tree limbs. We're doing cone bras. I want them on the guys too. So that's when I created the cone bra thing and put her on a bed. And, uh, and that was the controversy of the tour because she was the one that took it to the masturbatory place. I hadn't planned on masturbation at the end of the piece, but she wanted to masturbate on that bed. And I said, well, Hey, it's your tour girl. Do what you want. And, uh, to, things that I remember that happened in Toronto, we were almost closed down. They were almost closed down. The police came and filled the whole back of the auditorium and they were going to stop the show. If she did the masturbation sequence, which she did, and they didn't stop the show, but even more wonderful for me was the fact that the Pope at the time said that with the blonde ambition tour, Satan has been re-released into the world. And I thought, wow, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> so you know it was um it was truly both of us working together i mean i i cannot take full credit for that that was it was an incredible collaboration and she just part of it part of the reason i think that she was so open and giving to me was because she was in a time crunch and i had literally 21 days to create from scratch 18 songs totally from scratch. And yeah, so I think she just never had time to contradict anything I said, you know, 
Only one time. Um, we were doing the like a prayer section. And I said, okay, now I want you guys to lift, lift her. And she said, I don't want to be lifted like some girl. And I said, no, 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 not like a girl, Madonna, like a queen. And she said, lift me, guys. <laughs> that's all it took. A little psychology, you know, a little psychology. Yeah. And I guess that's part, that's such a big part of, um, uh, being able to work successfully with artists of that stature, whether Michael or Madonna, part of it is obviously having the vision to create these pieces of work. But I'm sure a big part of it is being able to massage a performance out of someone or create the um, the safe space for them to be able to let loose or to give that trust to you. How much of that um, do you think um, you learnt as you got to know the artist of like how to guide them through the process is that a part just a part of your um sensitivity or your character that you've always just had that ability or do you think that that's something that you i guess learned along the way well um i think that it was i think it's both i think it's part of my personality i'm kind of a genuinely nice person and um don't have a massive destructive ego and um also, I'm, I'm honest, I'm honest, like I pointed out the story with Express Yourself, you know, because that's just who I am. But I always say, look, this is my opinion. You've hired me and I'm just giving you my opinion. Ultimately, it's your choice. This is your career, your life, and whatever you think, that, that's what you should do. But I'm just giving you what I'm seeing from the outside. Um, but, you know, I had already been a director, so I had already dealt with actors and you know, and when you deal with actors, they're so sensitive that you have to know how to tactfully treat them in a way that you don't bruise their egos and you get what you need from them, you know. And so I think I carried that information into the workplace with not only Michael and Madonna, but with everybody I, I worked with, um, mm -hmm. Because everybody is so specifically different, so different, yeah. not only in the way they work, but in their personalities and their characters and in the way they express themselves, you know. So, um, yeah, I think that you have to be sensitive. You have to be sensitive and you have to um, listen as well uh, to what they want or what you feel they need. And hopefully you can fulfill that for them. Incredible. With Blonde Ambition, was that the intention going in to change the game? I mean, you must have been aware that what you were doing was so different to what had been done before. Yeah, I mean, we were aware of it, but we... Joel, I'm telling you, it was like a fucking rat race. I mean, it was, you know, like I said, I had 21 days before we had a week and a half, I think, only of tech over at the Disney lot before we went on tour before we went to Japan. So there wasn't a lot of time to think about things, you know? I mean, I would come home, I would come home at night and I would decide, okay, tomorrow I'm going to do, uh, keep it together. And I would make a loop of keep it together. And I would put it on a cassette and I would put the headphones on and I would fall asleep with the headphones on and that song going in my head. And I would wake up the next morning and I don't know how to explain it except to honestly say the whole piece was right there in front of my eyes. I went down to the street. The studio is just right down the street. I went down there, worked with my assistant. I said, okay, I got to get this out right now. And threw everything out. And okay, let's make it. Let's make it happen. And so then the dancers would come in and I would put it on the dancers to see how it worked. And then Madonna would come in after that because she was already doing vocal rehearsals and uh, weight training and she would come in and then she would learn and then that would be one day and we would learn that piece come in the next day I would do the same thing with another piece put it in the headphones come in the next day start from the beginning first thing we would do is review what we did had done yesterday and then learn a whole new piece so we never really had time to think about what we're doing other than to be excited and truly I don't know if I could have created it if it hadn't been for that, that specific company. They were all at the top of their games. The dancers were phenomenal. Nikki and Donna not only sang, but could move beautifully. 
And Madonna was game for anything I gave her to do, you know, and you have to be. But I will say one other thing. I think it also had to do, I think we were also able to make those changes because Michael and Madonna listened to me. And when you're early on in your career and you're hungry, you listen. And they were both hungry and they listened. The game changed, you know. After a while, they stopped listening because people start believing the hype, you know, and they start thinking that this is all coming from them. All the ideas are coming from them and they get caught up in all of the propaganda and whatever else it might be. Um, and I understand as time goes on, um, they didn't listen as well to other people, but but I was fortunate to get them when they were young, you know, younger at the beginning and hungry and open and ready to change the world. Yeah. And I was right there along with them. I'll, I'll just say one more thing. That was the only thing they ever said to me. Um, we want you to do something the world's never seen before. Well, come on as an artist to be paid well and to be given that dictum, you know, all we want is for you to create something the world has never seen. I mean, it's not like they're saying, we want you to do something that's like this or, can you do something that's similar to what they No, It was never that it was always how creative can you be? How can we change the world? Not so much in format like the tours or things or Super Bowl, but just in our imagination of whatever it was we were going to present, you know, and it just so happened to be that they both of those situations became game changers and, and changed the landscape. So, and I was happy to be part of both of them. So, Absolutely. Incredible. <laughs> That's history, man. Oh, the best. Um, you mentioned about the company of um, the Blonde Ambition Tour, that iconic group of dancers and Nikki and Donna, and then featured so heavily and became um, household names of their own through Truth or Dare. What were your thoughts on the film? Well, um, the one thing that I did know about Madonna that I picked up through the couple of things I had already worked with her on and working on the Blonde Ambition Tour was I knew that she used people to her own purposes. And so <clears throat> I made it very clear that I didn't want to be at all shot for the, for the, for truth or dare. And I think you see me at one moment at the beginning of the film, when we took it to, when we took the tour to Japan at the very beginning, I think I walk across the stage giving a note or something like that. And that's all, that's the only moment I have in Truth or Dare. Um, I didn't want to be part of it. First of all, because it wasn't so much about the process of creating the tour. It was about the tour once it went out. Yes. And like I said, once the tour goes out, it's like, you know, kicking the birds, baby birds out of the nest. Okay, you guys go fly. It's your lives now. Go do it. So I didn't feel that it was appropriate really for me to appear as a person or a character, so to speak, in Truth or Dare, because I wasn't part of what happened on the road. That wasn't, that wasn't my part. That wasn't part of me or, or my position. Hmm. Yeah. A huge part of the legacy of the film was its gay representation. And for a lot of people, especially young fans growing up to see an artist of the stature of Madonna, see, um, two gay guys kissing each other and say, Ooh, that's hot. Like she didn't cringe or she didn't, um, not only was she giving it the platform, but she was sort of like endorsing this incredible group of gay dancers and very much letting it be known that this was them and they're living their authentic lives. We, were you, um, aware at the time of how groundbreaking she was to the gay community? I'm sure, I'm sure that would have been. Oh, at the yeah. I mean, she, yeah, she was already at the forefront of, of making statements, you know, I mean, I think she'd already done the commercial where she was wrapped in the flag, the PSA where she was wrapped in the flag about AIDS and AIDS awareness. And no, she, you know, she was very, very much a part of that. And, and she was very much a part of the gay scene. You know, I mean, I, I, in New York, it was all the gay guy that it was the gay bars and all that she frequented where she started to get her notoriety. And, and these were her first fans and, and her support. And, uh, no, she has always, always, always been supportive of the gay community, always. And um, just vocal about it and whether it's just 
in general or, or the aid situation as it was. I mean, it was not easy to be someone who was a spokesperson for the AIDS epidemic at that time. I mean, it was very, very tough. People don't remember. I mean, but, you know, I was there and, you know, we were losing friends daily. I mean, daily. And so many of them came from the arts community. And so many of the guys that died were, were dancers, you know? So she was so aware of it and, you know, I'm getting teary eyed, but, you know, I have to say for, you know, there's a lot of things that people can say about her negatively, but I have to say in her lifetime, she's done some incredible things for the gay community. Absolutely. You know? And at a time yeah. when it was, it was risky. You were, you were, definitely putting your career on the line to take up. Absolutely. 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 And she did put her career on the line and thank God it, it all worked in support of her, you mm. know, mm. and um, yeah, we just talk, made her stronger and bigger. And better. Yeah. We talk so much today. We talk so much today about um, artists getting canceled for either you know, having a voice that is controversial or saying or doing the wrong thing. And yes. it's incredible, the, the balls. Like you were right when you said bigger balls than anyone in this room because she had no fear, yeah. seemingly had no fear yeah. to put her name on the line for something that she believed in. Just in well, and, and she was on the one side and then there was Elizabeth Taylor on the other side, you know. So here you have this these two female icons, one the voice of the younger community and a great voice of the gay community and Elizabeth Taylor, this, the queen of movie stars, you know, being as vocal and as supportive as Madonna. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. I lost a lot of friends. Yeah. Yeah. It makes so, me feel I'm the same. I'm tearing up as well. Thinking about like that incredible, incredible time. Just why uh, I think scary. what the world was. So scary. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Boy, I can't so even scary. imagine. I can't even, yeah, I can't even imagine um, the the way. It was really tough. It was, it was it was really tough. It was kind of like I would imagine what it would have been like in World War II or something, where you know your next door neighbor died, or your cousin died, or your brother died, or your father died, or everybody was dying. All these men were dying, you know. Yeah. And um, and the same thing was happening during the. 80s and the 90s, you know, um, every time you turned around every day, almost every day, you heard of someone that you knew or who knew somebody that you knew or a dear friend, you know, um, yeah. it was a very, very difficult time. And we needed these heroines like Madonna and Elizabeth to stand up for, for us and to have a voice for us, for the unheard and especially when it was all being heaped on us as if it was a gay disease, you know, and um, that it took that it took great women to work to save men. Yeah, it was it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Thanks for speaking on that. I know it's a, an emotional thing and sorry to kind of, um, yeah, to kind of. Build oh, no, no, no. Listen, emotions are beautiful. And, you know, it's it's the memory is difficult, but yeah. the reality of it is that it did happen. And thank God we did have some people that were, were pushing us into the right direction and pushing everybody into the right direction in terms of education and sensitivity, um, and caring and, and, and medical, uh, needs. And it changed, it really changed because of people like Madonna and Elizabeth really. Totally. I think of, um, your worlds colliding with Michael and Madonna and, First of all, with the um, Oscars performance with Madonna and performing um, the Dick Tracy number that you choreographed. Sooner or later. Yeah. And then her date that night, lo and behold, Michael Jackson. Again, one of those moments well, that, you know, viral before viral, that's like people just couldn't believe that <laughs> happening. Well, it, was, it was so funny because, you know, I would be working with Michael one week and then the next week I'd be working with Madonna on something. Then I'd be working with Michael. Then I'd be working with Madonna. And each of them, like they didn't know each other. And they would each, each ask me questions about the other one, you know. And they, they didn't like each other at first. You know, they were like, Michael would be like, what's she really like? You know, I don't think she's a very nice person, is she? 
No, she's fun, Michael. She is. She's fun. She's crazy, you know. She's wild, but she's really fun. I don't know. She's I don't. She it, she. I think she told Michael that um, in the closet she would do it with him if he did it in drag. <laughs> And then I'd be with Madonna and she'd be like, well, what's he like? And I would say, well, well, you know, he's crazy. He's a nice guy and everything. And then one time I had to go meet Madonna and um, I got out from meeting her and I, I came out to her you know, into the driveway to get into my car. And I see this little hand waving in this other car. And I look over and I go over and it's Michael. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure if that's when they decided that they were going to go together or something, but he told me that Madonna was his first French kiss. Oh, wow. <laughs> that Madonna was his first French kiss. That creates in your mind. Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Especially back then, you know, so... Yeah. Anyway, it was uh, it was glorious when they came to the academies together. And, yeah, I can't um, even imagine the conversation sense. between the two of them because they're just polar opposites with, you know, and I feel like Madonna yeah. has really been getting off on the fact that she could have really kind of, you know, pressed Michael's buttons and say things oh, like yeah. a response or a reaction. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he got embarrassed so easily. Yeah. He got embarrassed so easily over things, and she loved to embarrass people. So, I, I you know, I would have loved to have been in that limo. <laughs> See what went down there that night, but you know, we'll never know. Yeah, unless she puts it in her in her movie, maybe she'll include it in her film. Who knows? You know, I hope so. I hope so. Next time on Nineties Gay, we discover Vincent's work in film, and also the bird cage that I choreographed uh, uh, for Mike Nichols and. Uh, Fossey, 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 Michael Kidd, Michael Kidd, Michael Kidd, Madonna, Madonna. <laughs> In the meantime, make sure to check out episode one where Vincent discusses creating Smooth Criminal for Michael Jackson. I brought it up to Michael and I said, I have this crazy idea, man, that I want you to, you know, do this, you and the guys that you're with, to do this lean and then you come back up and he goes, well, how do we do it? Be sure to follow us on Instagram at 90sgay. Like, subscribe, follow, you know the drill, and we'll see you next time.